Good afternoon, everyone. Can I, can I just ask everyone to settle down? Thank you. So good afternoon, and welcome to our panel this afternoon. I'm expecting this to be a vibrant and engaged afternoon. We have some fantastic panelists, um, and we have some different views. However, what I am expecting this afternoon is a collision of ideas, but not of personalities. A very wise colleague of mine says that often. So for the next hour, what we're going to explore is conservation. Who owns the conversation? Is the global north driving our conservation approach and narrative in Africa? In terms of the format of this afternoon, what we've decided to do is to start with five statements, which I will give you, but then the panel can respond to them. They're not necessarily true, but they're statements that we're going to explore this afternoon. Then I'm going to ask each of the panelists to give us their perspectives, just a couple of minutes, a high level, so that we know where they're coming from as they answer the questions that I'm going to put to them. Then we're going to consider, do we really have an issue? And I have some questions for the panel. And then, taking Nikki's advice, we're going to think about, do we have solutions to these issues? And that's where we will really, hopefully, spend our time. So, this afternoon, I'm afraid with all of that, we probably won't have time for questions from all of you, but let's see how we go. So, to start the conversation, these are my five statements. Number one, the wealth of the global north is providing the majority of funding for conservation in Africa. Number two, not enough funding is coming from Africa. Number three, from the power of this funding, the global north is dictating our strategy in conservation and in our research. Number four, our African voices are not being heard loud enough. And number five, probably because of all of this, there are not enough African solutions to the dilemmas of African conservation. So as I said earlier, luckily I've got some people here with me today who are much more knowledgeable than me on conservation. I have to declare I'm, in, I'm from the finance world. Um, so we have Sally Archibald here from WITS, Bongani Bingwa, who seems like we're the wrong way around today. Um, Bongani is usually the one asking questions. We can um, Bongani is from 702 um, and previously Carte Blanche, am I right? Still. Still, okay. Um, and then uh, next to Bongani, we have Nolwazi um, Mbongwa from UCT, and then we have Peter Fernhead at the, at the end from African Parks. So rather than spending time introducing each of the panelists in detail, I'm going to assume you did your homework and you read the bios in the pack. If you didn't, please refer to page 42. Um, <laughs> so um, instead of that, I'm going to spend the time asking the panelists, why do you bring a particular insight or perspective to this, conservation, this conversation? And in doing so, I'm very happy for you to bring in things from your background um, to explain where you're coming from. So if I could ask Sally to start, and then we'll just go clockwise. Thanks, Sally. <laughs> Thank you. It's a very difficult question, especially for me, um, because uh, I'm an ecologist. I don't, wouldn't call myself a conservation scientist. Um, I work across Africa, many different ecosystems, both inside and outside conservation areas. And I'm particularly fascinated by how humans interact with ecosystem processes in our ecosystems. So then it's very easy for me to say, oh, well, I'm a scientist, it's all very objective. But I know that science, um, the opinions and the values of the scientists are driving the science that we choose to do. So I come from Johannesburg, and I find beauty in natural landscapes that most people would probably have dismissed as degraded many years ago. So I do come from a perspective of, of trying to find value in systems that are considered degraded. Um, and then as a white South African, 
I have an interesting perspective. South Africans are contrary people, and I was trained by scientists who have confidence in challenging ideas that come from outside that don't fit with their experiences. Um, so I have channeled that confidence, um, and I think that is really great when I work with networks of scientists across Africa, because we can help each other to develop that confidence together um, and to speak with and to like, have our voices heard. But it also becomes complicated because as a South African, as a confident South African, one could perpetuate these power imbalances that we're talking about today and start to try to push South African conservation objectives <coughs> on other parts of Africa. So that's where I sit in this complicated debate. Thank you, Sally. Bongani, over to you. Well, hello, everyone. Um, we can stop any time, Polly. <laughs> <laughs> I much prefer myself there asking the questions. Uh, my name is Bongani Bingwa, and I have been a television and radio broadcaster in South Africa for many years. So I'm going to be speaking today wearing two hats. Firstly, of course, as part of the investigative journalism team with Carte Blanche, which is the longest uh, running television show of its kind in South Africa. And what that means for me is that I have trudged in E. coli infested rivers, I have chased rhino poachers, I have stood on threatened dunes, but most importantly, I've interviewed communities who've been at the forefront of the effects of changes and around conservation issues for many, many years. Communities that have experienced the worst of what corporate interests working in concert with government can do when they feel that the little guy is powerless and voiceless to speak. So I have definitely witnessed the machinations of big government aligned, as I say, with corporate interests and deep pockets, even to the degree that they would actively seek to divide those local communities so there isn't clarity of one voice about things that would affect people on the ground. But I also host a morning show of the biggest talk radio station in South Africa. And to a degree, I guess, I'm supposed to be a leader on many conversations, including conservation. But I also think it places me in a unique position to be able to gauge what it is people want to talk about when it comes to these topics. So I've got a, a number of questions that I'm going to be using to frame how I see this conversation, really just about how well does the media cover conservation in South Africa specifically, but more broadly on the continent. I was for many years involved with the SAB Environmental Awards, which were about journalists and how this work is being done. So I think I have some insight in terms of not only what is established, but perhaps mm -hmm. the pipeline of journalists, particularly when it comes to broadcast journalists, in terms of what's coming ahead. But what is covered? What is driving uh, the coverage? Mm -hmm. What perspectives? What difficulties do those journalists and reporters face in covering those things? Um, but also, I think, the question of funding, right, and how the global north may find its voice in the stories we tell versus stories that are driven by Africans for an African audience. And I just thought perhaps as a starting salvo, let me tell you that in 2009, a Nigerian journalist called Evelyn Tagbo conducted a study focused on climate change. And she wanted to know how extensively this was covered on the continent. And she focused on the two biggest economies, South Africa and Nigeria. And she found that it was limited to 0.1% for Nigeria and 0.3% for South Africa. These, um, this is from the leading publications. And so if anything, what I want to say is where, when it comes to the space I operate in, I think if many communities could speak, they would stand boldly and use that oft-used socio-political slogan, nothing about us without us. Mm. Thank you, Bongani. Very, um, very troubling statistics. Mm. Nawazi, can I hand over to you? Thank you, Polly. Um, I think it's still good afternoon. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And as Polly has mentioned, my name is Nola Zimbongwa, and I call myself a bridge. And why do I say I'm a bridge? Because I come from a traditional resources background, but at the same time, I'm a scientist. 
and I am an advocate for youth, but I'm an advocate for sustainable youth. And where I come in in this conversation is how sometimes the North understands conservation from a point of saying, let's stop people, let's bar people from using, but not understanding that there's a reason why these plants are used, there's a reason why these animals are used. Mm. But at the same time, what we also need to understand is that the conversation should not be driven from the outside, but from the inwards out. Meaning that we all talk about a top-down approach. I'm going to speak about an inwards, outward approach, whereby we are getting into communities to understand, not to educate. I hate the word, I have to say. We cannot be going to communities that have lived with these resources for years, lived experiences, and we come with what we learned from books and say to them, we are here to educate. So what I want for this, from this whole conversation and why I even agreed to be part of this panel was to drive across, as Bongan has mentioned, that local communities exist. They are not part and parcel of conservation. That area is where they live. It's part and parcel of who they are. It's their identity. Before we come up with funding programs, before we think of telling them what to do, we should understand that we are not tapping into just a resource base, we are tapping into an identity of the people that actually inhabit that particular piece of land. Thank you. Thank you. And Peter, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Polly. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Peter Fernhead. I am the CEO of um, an organization called African Parks. Uh, so, I mean, in, a, in a nutshell, what we do, uh, we manage protected areas across the continent. Not every protected area in the continent, but uh, we're working towards that. <laughs> um, but we do manage uh, 22 national parks in uh, 12 different countries. And I guess that's why I'm here, is because I think we do have a, a, a quite a broad continental perspective uh, on some of these issues. Um, and I guess uh, starting with the conclusion, uh, if the hypothesis that you've laid out is correct, then we're probably one of the bad guys uh, because um, I, I think we're the biggest conservation organization on the continent. Uh, we receive approximately $120 million a year that's coming mostly from the global north and applying it into Africa. Um, so if, uh, if it is a problem, then we might be perpetuating it uh, and we'll get into whether I think it's a problem or not a little bit later. So Thanks. thank you. Thanks, Peter. Um, but I, I think you would say African Parks is an African organization. Yeah, very much so. So I think one of the differences uh, to the, most of the major uh, conservation agencies working on the continent, mm. we are completely founded here. All of the original founding members were from here. Uh, and so it is way more homegrown than uh, most of the other, uh, certainly the big, uh, the big the, what we call the bingos, the big conservation NGOs. Mm. So I think what we have today is um, a panel that comes from very different perspectives, um, but everybody seems to have a concern for communities. Um, and I'm hoping that that's something that will come out during the panel, so just to note it here. So now that we have everyone's perspectives, we sort of know where they're going to come from, what I'd like to move on to is, is the, the question of do we have an issue? Um, is the global no north really dominating in our conversation in Africa? And I thought the best place to start was to say, even if they are, do we have differences? So what I want to ask each of our panelists to answer is, can you give us an example of where African researchers and researchers from the global north disagree about a conservation question or approach? I'm really trying to understand that even if they were dominating, would it matter? Shall I start with Peter and come back towards me this time? Peter, over to you. Yeah, it's, um, I think the, the important thing, I think to the starting point is the recognition that uh, we have a global problem, a global climate and biodiversity problem, and therefore, if the globe isn't part of the solution, then Africa, more than anyone, is going to incur the consequences of that. So we need this interface, this dialogue, uh, and the funding uh, that comes from it. With that comes the potential for, for attention. Um, however, it's, it's something where I think in any of these kinds of things, there is a, there's a transaction. There's the funder and there's the, the, the recipient. Uh, 
if the recipient sees themselves as being a, uh, a government with a begging bowl that's out, then they're going to then they're going to take in anything that comes their way. We have never ever seen that. It's something where uh, governments are very responsible um, counterparts in those negotiations. They are equals in that transaction, uh, and as a result of that, it's something where uh, they can be very very demanding. And I think that. Uh, by both the funder and the recipient, the service provider being demanding in that makes for a very, very healthy transaction and a robust relationship. Mm -hmm. And with that comes accountability. And the accountability goes both ways. So I personally think it's an extremely important uh, part of what we do. Um, every now and again, we have seen on a couple of occasions where funders think that by funding, there is uh, the ability to procure uh, a change in policy, and if that's the expectation, then I think that they've crossed a line which is beyond just demanding an accountability, because it should be a, a sovereign government's sovereign right to be able to determine policy on behalf of their population, and I think that one's got to be very careful of stepping over that line. Thanks, Peter. Um, I, I suppose what you're saying is, is the government is the one having a negotiation with the funder, with African Parks sort of in the middle. Yeah, so, I mean, typically we are, African, uh, we are an African government's partner. So mm -hmm. when we sit with a, uh, with a funder, our primary interest is the government whom we are representing. Of course, we need the funding to be able to do what we do. But if, it, uh, uh, if, if there is a demand or an expectation for us to do something that we're not comfortable with knowing exactly what government wants, we, we just don't do it. Yep, yeah, yeah I see. Nawazi. Um, thank you, Polly. Um, firstly, for me, it's yes, we can look at the global north as also being part and parcel of the problem. But I also think we also need to dig deep from local because as conservationists and scientists, we are the ones that approach the Global North for funding or vice versa. But then now the, sometimes the issue starts when I as a conservationist or as a scientist already think that I know what is needed by the community. And then taking that idea and then selling it to a funder. So now a funder has certain expectations or realizations that the community also agrees. Then we find ourselves in a position whereby the community might agree because we, we are in a, in a country where it's a developing country. Obviously, money is always needed. But now what we don't understand is that there are a lot of other factors at play when it comes to funding. We need to understand the concept of consent. I think there's a huge issue with not understanding the concept of consent, not only from the funders, but also from us who also approach those funders because we go there with an understanding that this is what the people want, this is what they need. But have we really understood consent? Mm -hmm. And what I mean by consent, consent not from an individual. Africans will live in the spirit of Ubuntu. I am because you are. So now it's just because I agreed on my own personal capacity. Doesn't mean my community agrees. So now how, does then now, how, do, how do we then now as conservationists understand that concept that most African communities are still in unison? And so now what happens with some funding strategies, you get into a community and the community ends up being divided, as Bongani mentioned, because there's money involved. Mm. And this is because we don't have ethics in how we do research, number one. And that now translates in us not having ethics in how we fund projects. Thank you. I think we'll come back to this consent mm. issue. I think it's, it's an important one. Bongani. Well, I mean, <clears throat> I joked a little earlier with you, Polly, that I feel that I come into this conversation really as the rank outsider. And it's one of those things that we in the media have to negotiate. If you're talking about funding and expectations of organizations that are being funded to take a particular stance, particularly, of course, if the money coming from the global north is already informed by certain perspectives against particular governments. Mm -hmm. You talk about communities. Part of what we have to navigate as the media is when there are apparent divisions within communities, some for, some against particular projects, what informs the perspective of even the scientists who come into those communities and say, but hang on, we asked the communities. So part of what we have to do in the media space is to always be able to interpret the motives and mm -hmm. the moves that are at play yep. when, in fact, at times we are barely able to tell the story at its most basic level. You've already mentioned the issue of the climate challenges that we face. I mean, 
in this region, I don't have to tell anybody uh, here, right, what we are experiencing in the SADC region, particularly, of course, South Africa and Zimbabwe. We know the effects of adverse weather events, but we also know that coverage of these issues is completely disproportionate to the level of threat they pose to communities. And it is an issue of capacity, it is an issue of funding, and there's also, I think, a global ethical challenge because, as we all know, the communities, the peoples that are going to face the effects of what we're dealing with. Yes, it's well and good to talk about how it's all our problem, but we know the people who are at the forefront of it, the people who are on the front lines. And I want to posit something that may be perhaps a little controversial. I think that we often run away from looking at these issues and we look at them outside of the lens of our history and the legacy of colonialism, the legacy of development, the trajectory of what that looks like, right? The story of the climate crisis is a story of inequality. The communities that bear the brunt of this, we may couch it in nice terms of being in the global south, but they're black and brown people. We cannot separate the issue of race in terms of how this affects people, who's responsible for it, and who's walking away from bearing any responsibility to help those communities that aren't the largest contributors to the problem. Yep. It's a social justice issue, it's a human rights issue, it's also a race problem, but if the media doesn't have the funding and the capacity to look at it in all its complexity, we're not gonna be able to tell that story and the little guy is going to be left behind. Thanks, Bangoni. Sally, over to you. Can I take you back to the original question, though? I, I want to explore, really, in your experience, do you have differences in the outcome of your research from your, your um, equivalents in the global north? Yes, I mean, I think I can give you an example. As a fire ecologist, I'm going to use a fire e example. Um, we are currently refuting a paper published earlier this year which is on using fire abatement um, programs to restore degraded protected areas in Africa and fund lion conservation. So it's a really good news story. Um, but there was only really one point in that paper where we agreed with the authors, and that was that there's not enough funding for lion conservation. From there, our positions departed dramatically. Um, the authors stated that our, all of our conservation areas in Africa are degraded, and that changing the fire regime to early season burning will restore them. And in this, I believe they just showed a shocking lack of understanding of ecological processes like tree grass ratios and erosion. Um, and then they also totally ignored the kind of a, immense range of tools of reasons why people in conservation areas burn. There's a lot of research and ideas about fire which they w dismissed entirely. I mean, for example, Tick control, the best way to control ticks is to burn late in the season, and Winston Trollope managed to restore buffalo populations in Ngorongoro Crater by instituting a burning program to control the ticks. Um, bush encroachment is a serious degradation problem in many of our parks, and early season burning does nothing to control bush encroachment. Managers in parks need to burn to manage poaching, to manage biodiversity, to create heterogeneity, so fire is this useful tool and we need to have autonomy to use it but the authors were basically trying to apply a continuous fire regime across the whole continent and claiming that that would always have good consequences for the environment. Um, so we challenged this, um, but One Earth declined to publish our rebuttal because they like to publish consensus science and we couldn't come to a point of consensus with the authors. So the state at the moment is that their paper is the message out there that everyone is hearing despite the fact that our rebuttal was produced by more than 20 scientists and conservation officials and people who are working in carbon offset programs across the continent. Um, so this is an example where I feel really there's a huge divergent and it yeah. does have important conservation and funding implications. Yeah. So can I follow on with, um, with another question and I'm going to sort of give the panelists different questions now, but still around this, do we have an issue? Um, so so Sally, I read a BBC article recently that said of the, of the 10, sorry, of the most, 100 um, most cited articles about climate change, only one of them was African. 
Only 12 of them were written by a woman, but I think we'll deal with that on a different day. Um, can you respond to that, Sally? Do you feel like the researchers in, in South Africa and Africa get less publication, get less attention? How do you feel about that issue? Well, the numbers sort of speak for themselves, I suppose, although you would have to juggle it by how and much it was fewer the scientists as well. there are. Yep. Um, but I do think there's two reasons for that, and one of them is something we can do something about. I mean, firstly, we as African scientists, we don't really, we're not very good at making our ideas and our opinions known. I, the number of amazing science papers that I read that have really important conservation implications that are published in quite low-impact journals and the policy implications are hidden behind complicated graphs, unlike our Global North colleagues who from students are trained to bring their ideas to the fore and point out the important policy implications. And we can learn to do that also. We can make our voices louder. Um, I mean, I don't know a PhD student in America who hasn't submitted one of their papers to science, the journal Science. And yet, I don't know any African scientists who ever think of trying to publish in science. So it's really just about our attitude and making sure that we get our ideas out there. But so I think there's a bit of a call to action, isn't there? We need to have a bit more confidence in ourselves and yeah. you know, get papers published overseas as well. Yeah, but I mean, having said that, as part of, we run, I'm a co-chair of the COSOR network, which is a large plot network that crosses like 12 different African countries. And there's a bit of tension among the European and the African scientists about what we should be using this data set for. African scientists want to study sustainable harvesting. They're really just interested in using the data to help us manage our ecosystems sustainably. Um, and our Global North colleagues are focused on maybe carbon storage and more esoteric science biodiversity questions. Um, and currently, I suspect most of the research has gone in the Global North way, but we are working together and many of our European scientists are helping us to kind of bring our ideas to the fore in that collaboration. Good to hear. Mm. Bongani, can I turn to you um, with, a, with a question about Disney? Nikki mentioned Disney in his opening speech. Disney has told powerful stories about Africa. Think Lion King, think Tarzan, and more recently, I've been hearing about the Woman King, um, slightly controversially. Um, do you think that these simplistic and idealistic views of Africa make it harder for the global north to understand the complexities of conservation? Sure, I think from the perspective of the media, we've also got to have some introspection, right? Because we very much dictate what the public taste ought to be. We decide what the public should know, how and when they should know it. So a huge part of the responsibility in terms of how we frame these issues also rests on us. And I'm afraid if, if if we rely on Disney as, you know, the tellers of the story of what we are faced with, then, then I think we've got a long way to go. I might even go so far as to say, if that's what we are saying, then to some degree, there is, there is a sense that some of those narratives are in fact quite insulting to Africans, right? Because if we are generous and say that Hollywood really did care about uh, silverbacks or the circle of life, You've got to ask one question. Where are the people? Where are the people as the center of those narratives? You mentioned the woman king, and although, of course, it doesn't set itself as an historical record or account of what happened, but rather a fantasy picture, a dramatized picture, that story is changing because of the involvement of Africans in the telling of it. But we've got to be careful of the tropes that are part of the legacy of colonialism. I mean, I'm shattered to hear that you're saying, Sally, that even from a research point of view, there is a reluctance for Africans to tell their own story in terms of what is a priority to us and what we face. And so I think for me, I still have enormous hope that ultimately by centering the people of the continent, certainly from a media point of view, and making our stories relevant to our people, the global north may begin to listen the global north may begin to understand our perspectives beyond stories of pitiful famine and starvation, but actually understand that we also, our scientists, have goals and plans in terms of how to be sustainable and how to make our communities have a contribution.
Thank you. Nawazi, can I go in a, a different direction now? Um, I'd like to talk about carbon offset programs. So my understanding is that these are potentially cheaper to set up in Africa, and therefore there is a bit of a flood of, of requests to do it. How do you feel about that with your understanding of communities? Do you have concerns about these carbon offset programs? Um, thank you, Polly. Um, so for me, it's a yes and a no type of um, response to your question as to um, is it a good thing or is it not a good thing? But um, my first um, um, issue is, is with, with, with some of carbon offset programs that have been um, established in Africa is that some of them come at the expense of people being removed from their land for conservation to occur. Yep. And for me, it does not make sense then to now, you want to solve a problem by creating a problem. And sometimes I find um, carbon offset programs to be um, 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 a power type of dynamic because if we are now going to communities and introducing such um, 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 projects, we first need to understand how much are these communities actually contributing to the carbon emissions, number one. After that, only then we can start engaging them in that such because currently Africa as a whole is the one that is contributing the least in terms of carbon emissions. But yeah. most carbon offset programs are coming to Africa. Is it because we don't have much? So they want to dangle money around us for us to say, okay, let's do that, you know? But then now we need to understand how much are they contributing before we can decide what needs to be done. Because I also find it to be problematic, and as, as um, Fish, uh, Reynold also showed in one of his studies where there were 42 programs that were carbon offset programs, and most of those programs were financial incentives from corporates. And those ones that were more corporate related failed because it was only money driving the projects. But those ones that had the communities involved were the ones that survived out of the 42 programs. And this is because once, as I mentioned when I started this talk, that once you remember that there's an identity associated with land, there's an identity associated with how people use resources, those people become custodians of projects once you have left with your money. But if the only thing you came to show to the people was money, the moment that money runs out, they will not care about the project anymore. Yep. So for me, carbon offset programs can only make sense, number one, once we understand who are the large contributors, and number two, is there a need in that particular community for such a program? And then understand also, what has this community been doing all along to try and offset carbon emissions? Because obviously they've not been sitting and waiting for us conservationists and scientists to do something. They've already been doing something. So I think they work if, as I've mentioned, there's consent and there's understanding of traditional ecological systems. But at the same time, we also need to understand the, 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 the pressures we put on people when the only thing we offer them is money. And we need to understand that some projects won't survive because of money alone. Yeah. So if we want these carbon offset programs to be sustainable, we need to make sure communities are involved, understand them, and, 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 and buy into them. Yep. Thank you. Peter, can I, sorry, Mongani. No, I was going to jump in and say, and also show me the money. I mean, when, <laughs> when, when we are made promises from the global north mm. around uh, what we are going to be funded, who stands to benefit? You know, how much of these, uh, how much is that generosity really actually ultimately going to be up to communities to pay for over the long run? Yeah. So we've got to be able to figure out those intricacies as well. And so not just assume that we've got this largesse and that the money comes in for free without any expectations. Mm. Mm. Sally, do you want well, to? Well, it also show us that it will actually achieve conservation objectives. I mean, yes. we're talking about conservation here. Mm. Like you say, if it's not aligned with how we want our ecosystems to look and what we think are healthy ecosystems, mm. that would also be something to check. Can Peter, I add, yep. add to the, the carbon discussion? It's something where if the system's working, then these kinds of things shouldn't happen. Mm. So there is no money coming in from carbon if the uh, credits aren't audited, if the, uh, uh, the spread of where that money is going to in terms of governments, in terms of communities. So it might happen one year, it might happen another year, but it's not going to happen on, a, on an ongoing basis. Mm. Not if the system is working and all of the checks and balances are in place. Yeah. So proceed with caution is yep. what I'm hearing. 
So in the interest of time, I'm now going to switch into what are the solutions. Um, and, and I'd like to split them into what are the solutions from a model perspective and what are the solutions from a funding perspective? Mm -hmm. um, and, and covering a broad sort of both research and also looking after conservation areas. Mm -hmm. So, um, Bongani, you've spoken a lot about media. We know that that's where you're coming from here. How do you think the media in Africa could really help to amplify the voice of, you know, of communities, of our scientists, um, to make sure that when we turn up at COP27, we actually are represented. I'm going to answer it by telling a little story. The other day, I was uh, transported by an Uber driver who spoke Isimbondo. So it means he comes from the Eastern Cape. Now, Isimbondo has a particular... It's got a, it's got a cadence, it's got quirkisms that are quite unique to it, and only really, I suppose, the initiated would understand. It's also easily identifiable because it's so rare in this part of the country. Uh, most people who are Amambondo come to Gauteng and they fall in line with Sisikosa or Sisulu, and you never really quite can tell who they are. This fellow came to Johannesburg as part of a wave of migration, as many rural people do, to urban centers. He hails from Kolobeni in the Eastern Cape, and he says he fled the area as disputes arose between divided community members and organizations that were and that were for and some, of course, against uh, mining the pristine wild coast. We all know, of course, about the Australian company, Transworld Energy Mineral Resources, who came looking for titanium in that area in 2001. We all know the David and Goliath struggle that spent, what, nearly two decades in, in courts. I first went to Kolobeni to, to report on the issue, I think it was in 2008, and we spoke to community members, we spoke to the Amadiba Crisis Committee that had been formed there. I remember challenging the local mayor at the time because they were pushing this issue very, very hard in terms of the benefits that the community was going to derive from this project. And, you know, I'm always careful that when we're in conversations like this, we don't use these big words that are completely alienating to the communities about which we are talking, right? Um, Depeasantization, for example, is a word you might hear. Uh, De-agrarianization, de right? Fancy, but consequential words for those communities. Because the thing to understand about the problem of Kolobin, the people there, like anybody else, completely and fully appreciate the splendor of the pristine beaches, the splendor of those dunes. But for them, as Nolwazi, I think, has alluded to, it's about protecting their way of life. Here was this mining giant coming, it appeared, with the backing of government to pursue this project, and the communities were not asked for their consent. In fact, that, that's what the court decision was about, that in fact you may not pursue these projects, you may not initiate these projects without getting consent from the custodians of that land, which of course are the local communities. But my story about Kolobeni in 2008 is the meeting I had with one activist, Nontle Mbutuma, who is from the Amadiba Crisis Committee. In 2007, they formed that organization to try and fight off the big Goliath that was coming into town. Ten years later, the small organization was still dealing with police using stun grenades, tear gas, death threats. My Uber driver came to Johannesburg because one of the founders of the Amadiba Crisis Committee was shot dead in 2016 and happened to be a cousin of his. And the story, the narrative that was on the TV news every night was that this was a divided community, uh, there, there was no single voice that government could listen to as far as this project is concerned. There were divisions amongst social justice activists about the approach to take the lawyers that got involved, civil society also explaining it in different ways. But for me, what is the power of that story is that there were many journalists who trudged 
that road. I remember once we were stuck on the road to the wild coast and our bucky broke down because what should have been a 20 kilometer stretch of road took us about four hours to navigate because of how remote some of these communities were. And that's why big business, that's why big capital, with, of course, the collusion of government, can feel that they can run roughshod over these communities if no one is there to tell the story. When I told him I had been down there, when I told him I had met his cousin, he could not believe that story. And it was one of those where I thought, maybe we didn't get the outcome I thought we would in 2008, but at least I could say to him, I was one of the people that told your story, and that makes it all worth it for me. Thank you. I'm going to come back to you on this corporate, um, what, what the media can do, um, how, they can, how they can push back against these um, corporate funding issues. Sorry, Peter. Polly, just to pick up on what Bongani was saying and the role of the big corporates, so I'm not, not speaking against that. But I think the other thing which is a little bit hidden there in what, uh, what you've just related is the role uh, and the difference of opinion often between governments and local people. And that's something which certainly in our experience is actually a way bigger issue between a national government and local people yeah. than between the global north and the global south. Uh, I think that's a more, uh, yeah, more important issue. So Peter, I was going to ask you about that because I've talked to you about it before. Where, where have you experienced those sort of issues and how has African Parks addressed them? Yeah, it, it, it's a tough one because our agreements come from central government. So we always say that uh, our permission to operate in the country comes from, uh, from central government, but the social license to operate comes from local people around a protected area. And that's a very difficult one to, to, uh, to play. But if you're looking for some... Uh, very specific examples, you know, in a country like Zambia, uh, uh, central government, the Department of National Parks and Wildlife will take a 50% top line, so 50% of revenue on any kind of wildlife utilization uh, from an area around a national park. That basically means that there's a taxation of 50% top line on wildlife or conservation as a natural resource use by local people uh, and so you end up having conservation completely outcompeted by any other form of natural resource use. So it's, it's, a, it's just an example where that, that desire to appropriate and to centralize revenues and control at a central government level is often very, very bad for local people around a protected area. Yeah. Heartbreaking to, to hear that central governments are really not protecting the communities that they should be. We've got to ask the question, why? I mean, I, I, I hear you, far be it for me to disagree with you on this, but part of the reason governments don't always act in the interests of their people mm. is who is funding those projects, right? What do they stand to benefit? And this obviously also boils down to what approaches even within conversation, uh, within conservation might be adopted. And so when you've got a paucity of skills in terms of being able to pick through issues at a local level, at a national level, at an international level, of course communities, of course countries are hoodwinked into accepting certain scenarios because the people who are meant to be gatekeepers, the media in my space, can hardly understand all of those layers of complexity. Mm. Mm. Yeah, but um, my other issue, you know, sometimes, Bongani, is now who regulates the media when the media is not doing the right thing? Because we can say now the media should be telling the African story, but then what if the media itself already has a misconception or they have their own agenda? Then how do we regulate that? Obviously, it's not a topic for today, but it's just something I think we should also have in mind that now, would, how do we regulate that? I wouldn't go that? so far as saying the media has an agenda, but if you're talking about a lack of funding, if you're talking about a lack of capacity, <laughs> it's easy for us to be hoodwinked. It's easy for us to be taken on a jaunt, a, you know, at, uh, at a COP meeting, for example, and come up with glowing stories of what the future holds for countries without ever examining the finer details and the fine print of what is being promised to people. It's easy for us, if we don't play our role, to become spokespeople mm. for government programs that are going to hurt the very people on whose behalf yeah. we believe we speak. So you're talking lack of funding in media, lack of funding to really get into these issues and to spend adequate time it's on it. It's a minefield. Yeah. 
<laughs> can, I, can I come back to something um, um, which, Nawaz, you, said, you referred to at the beginning? So, how could a better understanding of Ubuntu help in the context of conservation in Africa? How could it be part of the solution? Um, I think we'll have to go back to also what Bongani and uh, some of the other speakers have alluded to. Understanding that, especially from a South African context, we come from an oppressive colonial rule where there was never a position or a point where a black person's voice mattered much. Um, and so now, when we want to do research or when we want to do funding, why I think the spirit of Ubuntu matters is because that's where you start being part of the community. I always say it does not make sense for me for you to just get into a community once off and disappear. That's where you not, don't understand the spirit of Ubuntu because that's not what Ubuntu is. Ubuntu is, I'll visit you today and I'll visit you again tomorrow. And when you have an issue or a problem, you'll always come back to me. So we as conservationists, we are very good at taking. And we are very good at taking the knowledge and also at making it to be our knowledge. And at the same time, we are also very good at deciding what is good and what is not good for people. So the spirit of Ubuntu puts you in that person's position. And, and other people might describe this as being empathetic towards people. Um, and I think that will help to drive future funders and also to drive future con conversations of conservation. Just to make an example, so Dr. Jenny Bortha did a study with medicinal plants where a lot of funders and even some South African conservationists thought that um, flooding um, um, medicinal plants and nurseries would definitely save the medicinal species. But then it ended up being a total failure because all they were doing was just giving people money without understanding Number one, yes, there was an understanding why they're declining in the wild, but there was no understanding as to how can we solve the problem with the people. But then a few years later, Skukuza National Park from Kruger National Park, from Kruger National Park um, then they decided that, okay, the Wabega is being poached from inside the park. They even tried to hire rangers to also come and, um, and guard these plants, but they were still being poached. Until one of the social ecologists, Dr. Louis Soma, went into the community and started understanding how they live, started understanding why is the Wabeke salutaris plant important to them. Only then it mattered to her that, you know what, maybe let's start a nursery, but this nursery is not for us to protect the species, but this nursery is for us to grow these plants, and once they are at a particular level, we take these plants and we distribute it to the community, to a point that now Wabeke salutaris is being downgraded from endangered to, um, um, to vulnerable because of this work. So this is what I mean by taking yourself, putting yourself in the community for you to understand what the solution can be. Thank you, wonderful story. Peter, can I turn to you again? Mm. Um, how does African Parks navigate these difficult um, relationships between funders and governments and local communities mm. in things that are as tricky as hunting? What is your position on hunting? On, on hunting specifically? Yeah, on hunting specifically. How long have you got? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's, so we, we are a, when I say foreign organization, we domiciled here in South Africa, but we are foreign to every other country that we operate in, in Africa. So we always say that it's a government's sovereign role to, de uh, to determine its own policies. We're an executing agent. So we manage a protected area for on behalf of government. So we are implementing their policies. If we, if we don't agree with their policy, we have a kind of behind the scenes conversation with them and we can explain our thinking, but ultimately it's government's right to determine uh, uh, that policy. And the difficult ones are things like hunting, things like uh, even things like mining inside a national park. Believe mm -hmm. it or not, there are countries where the legislation allows for mining inside a national park. So we have the conversations, but our view is we are there to implement government's policy. If, if a funder then expects us to uh, manipulate that policy or to try to convince government otherwise, then it's something where we're not going to receive their funds because we are there to do a job on behalf of a sovereign government at their invitation. So things like uh, hunting very specifically, 
Uh, this might be dodging the, uh, the, the, it's not dodging the issue, it's, it's how we, um, uh, our formal position on it. And that is our position on hunting is government's position on, on hunting in that particular country. If they want hunting, we make sure that it's executed ethically and in accordance with the rules. And if they don't, then we make sure that it isn't. It's, it's literally as, as, as simple as that. that. Yeah. And, so, and sorry, can I just come back? Those issues for me, uh, and I'm going to say something contr controversial here, even something like mining in a national park is something where it is theoretically possible if the governance structure is right. If the governance structure, the accountability, the transparency on all the deals and who's benefiting from them, then it's something where I'd say that almost anything is possible inside a protected area. Where these things go wrong is where the governance structure uh, and the people that are benefiting from certain decisions, when that goes wrong, mm -hmm. you've got problems regardless of what the actual activity is that's taking place inside the protected area. Can I follow on with a slightly more controversial question? If you felt that government really wasn't looking after the interests of the local community, mm. would you walk away from a park? Sure. Um, y yes, we would. It's something where if we really, really believe in it that strongly, we, we would do so. Um, have we, we've walked away from parks before, uh, but not for that reason, but I'd like to think that we would. So we've certainly, we've walked away from uh, four parks in our, in our, in our history of, of the, we've got the 22, but we've walked away from four because of various challenges and, and the inability to get it right. Uh, but I'd like to think that we would if they were getting it completely wrong at a community level, yes. Because ultimately, even if you've got government on your side, if you're not, uh, if you're not working with local people and getting their support for what you're doing, you haven't got a hope in hell of, of succeeding in the long run anyway. Uh, and therefore, you may as well leave. Thank you. Can I, Bongani, can I just ask Sally something? Um, it's sort of related, so I just want to link here. So, how do you feel about the fortress approach, Sally, to conservation, an approach which kind of assumes you, you can achieve conservation in the absence of human beings? But I want to ask it in a positive way. In, in what context have you seen this actually work, where um, there is more of a human utilization and conservation working alongside each other? Yeah, it's great to talk about solutions. Yes, um, exactly. Yeah, and I feel like uh, we're just initiating a new program called the Future Ecosystems for Africa program, which is starting. It's a five-year program, and we're trying to work at the scales of Africa inside and outside <coughs> conservation areas um, to get at some of these solutions. Uh, and to me, I feel like in the germ of your question and the comments that you've been making, there are, there are really two different solutions we need to find. And the one is coming to a common consensus about what is conservation. Um, can we agree about how to use and manage our ecosystems? Um, and in that context, what level of human resource extraction is appropriate in different contexts? Um, so one of the ways we're trying to kind of get at that from a research perspective, although we're also wanting to expand into thinking around the governance, because I agree with you. Uh, so I have a postdoc, Fezile, who has a poster out there, who's looking at um, human fieldwood harvesting and just trying to look at human fieldwood harvesting in the context of African elephants um, and trying to assess what level of human harvesting is equivalent ecologically to the ways that elephants use and work and live in our ecosystems. Uh, so taking a different approach in terms of can we understand spatially in Africa, in this environment, what level of human harvesting is actually ecologically uh, feasible and ecologically appropriate and what level could be considered to exceed some le um, ecological level. Uh, likewise, Tatenda is working with our CSO network to measure growth rates of trees, to use long, like 30-year data sets to try to work out what sustainable harvesting levels are. Um, once you have that information, once you say, we really think that this level of human utilization is appropriate, then comes the governance questions. Um, but then the other question that we need to solve if we're talking about solutions is something that Nolazi brought up, which is around how to fund these solutions. And we've seen some great talks in the last day or two 
uh, creative ways, you know, the wildlife economy, ways that conservation can also provide funding for the people who own the land. But we also have to recognize that sometimes uh, appropriate conservation requires like a reduction in human utilization, and sometimes it requires that people don't utilize or avoided land transformation. And so how do we fund communities who have these amazing natural resources, but then we all agree that they shouldn't use them to maximize their financial gain? How do we get that funding? Um, and we have colleagues working on that, trying to look at biodiversity financing and really raise the questions that I think all of us have raised around these sort of corporate entities and the global north uh, and the amount of money they're willing to give to conservation versus the amount of money they're willing to invest in resource extraction in Africa. So Orilwe Selomane, who's here, is driving a research program on that, um, basically just trying to make sure that this question is exposed and on the table, that the media can pick it up <laughs> and run with it. So that's why we love the work you're doing, Sally, looking for lots of solutions yeah. um, to these issues. And as Lee said to us yesterday, we need to experiment, we need to explore, we've got to find the solutions. So we've now almost run out of time. Um, so what I want to ask each of the panelists very quickly um, is what would be the key takeaway that you would like the audience to leave with today? Peter, can I start with you? Um. Very simply, and bringing it back to the kind of the core issue in terms of the global climate crisis and the global biodiversity crisis, the two are, are, uh, are interlinked. Africa has got the most to lose by not getting it right. Uh, and therefore, by definition, the corollary of that has got the most to gain by getting it right. Uh, so whatever the solutions are, irrespective of what they are, if they're working, embrace them, grab them, uh, and, uh, and copy them. Great, thank you. Nawazi. Um, for me, it's just one thing I'd like, not only for the global north, but for everyone here today, to understand that um, conservation is not a colonist concept. It always existed in Africa, and we just need to understand how to communicate better and understand that, you know, we like using the word illiterate as, 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 as scientists saying that, you know, communities are illiterate. Education has different facets, and some education is through lived experiences. And so I think we need to understand that from today, that when you go to communities for funding projects, there are people there with lived experiences, and who would understand way better than what you have learned in a book of what, or what you were told. So we just need to, need to understand and take that home today, that conservation is not a colonist concept. It always existed in Africa. Thank you. Bongani. I, I wanted, didn't come back to you. Sorry. No, I wanted to quick, it was a simple joke. I wanted to say, Peter, before you walk away, give us the scoop in the media, and then you can walk away. <laughs> <clears throat> um, look, I think there's some encouraging work that's already being done from a media space. Um, we've got a number of alternative or non-profit media outlets. Uh, I know uh, the Daily Mavericks, our Burning Planet project series is really good. Yep. Carte Blanche has done some phenomenal work in this space over many years. And so there are others that have come up, ground up, uh, is doing phenomenal work. But I think as you say, Noloazi, <clears throat> this should be a conversation that is based on people's lived experiences and not just niche conversations. But most importantly for the media, for African media, I think follow the money. This is a story of hundreds of millions of dollars. Where is that money going? Who controls it? Who spends it? Who makes sure that it does what it is meant to, right? Who funds the NGOs? Who funds the politicians? Who funds the positions that are taken, the lobbyists? We've got to make sure that it's a story of following the money without, of course, moving away from what lived experiences are experienced by communities. Thank you, Bongani. Sally. Yeah, I think I'd like to end with the message that we must be careful what we classify as degraded and degradation. African ecosystems are under an immense amount of pressure at the moment. They are providing resources <coughs> for millions and millions of people. Just the charcoal industry alone, if we took that away tomorrow, we'd have to put 13 new fossil fuel power stations there to replace the energy that's being provided by our ecosystems. So they're under a tremendous amount of pressure, but classifying them as degraded and worthless 
is it dangerous? Because mm. these ecosystems still house an immense amount of biodiversity. They have immense capacity to recover and regenerate. Um, and in the long term, these ecosystems are our wealth, as you said. So classifying them as degraded and encouraging the rest of the world to see them as a worthless resource that they can just then come and buy from us is dangerous. Let's look after all of our ecosystems. Great, thank you. So we have run out of time. I think I'm over, actually. Um, but thank you to our panelists. Thank you for spending the time with us today, sharing your insights. Um, I think it shows that when we get together and we have constructive dialogue, we can come up with solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.